So I'm here with Rufus Pollock. He's the author of the newly launched book, The Open Revolution. And uh, I have a few questions. I'm, I'm lucky enough to be able to have him uh, joining us from Florence. Uh, I'm here in Berlin, so hopefully the video conference will work fine. Uh, firstly, Rufus, uh, thanks very much for spending your very valuable time uh, having a chat. Um, it, it's really appreciated. It's, it's, it's great to have someone like you being able to speak uh, on these matters, not just publish a book. Uh, I'd really like to learn a little bit more about, I guess, your motivation at this time for, for getting this book out, uh, and certainly a little bit of a background as to maybe what the readers would expect. Yeah, well, so the essence of the book is that we can rewrite the rules of this information age, of this digital age, in a way that makes it work better for everyone. Um, that makes it fairer, freer, and, if you like, more profitable for all the different participants. Um, and that there's a real, also that there's a real issue with how we're running things at the present. That, and that what that it relates to is this choice between the way that we do, if you like, ownership. We can either have openness in which... Uh, um, digital information is shared by all, or we can have a closed model in which information is exclusively owned and controlled. And those, those, that choice gives very different worlds. In, if we choose open, we get a world of opportunity, uh, for, of entrepreneurship, of innovation, of creativity, and also of access and fairness and kind of, you know, um, egalitarianism, if you like. And on the other side, when we choose closed, which is the world that we're in today, we basically end up with digital dictatorships rather than a digital democracy. We end up in a world dominated by the few, uh, whether it's online, where we see a few companies like Facebook or Google dominating our experiences online, getting to shape and control them in ways that uh, they choose. Um, and excluding competitors or others who might threaten that, but also manipulating and shaping our experiences, um, selling our attention to the highest bidder uh, in the form of advertisers and so on. But also in many other areas, it even shows up in the world of medicines. You know, the cost, we have a world today where more and more people live with the reality that the set, that medicines they might need for their cancer treatment or for hepatitis C or whatever are rationed and very expensive. And Actually, if we choose an open world, we can both continue to have innovation, we can continue to incentivize and pay for innovation, but we can basically give access to everyone. Now, you might at this last moment think this sounds almost you know, too good to be true. And the key point also of the book is that we have been, we are in a new world. I mean, the subtitle almost is New Rules for a New World of the book. And to finish, why is it possible that we can have openness and that we can have both innovation and access, um, if you like, both growth and equality, is because of the very special nature of digital information, which is that it is costlessly copyable. Um, if you think of a bicycle, it can only be used by one person at one time. Either I'm riding it to the shops or you're riding it to work. That's a fundamental fact of the physical world that we've lived in for all of the time we've been homo sapiens. There is, it is rivalrous, as economists put it. Um, but information is not. You can send a copy of your holiday photo to everyone in your family, frankly, almost to everyone on the planet if you wanted to, at the touch of a button. That is, a, that is something just fundamentally different and extraordinary. And it's that that allows us to, as it were, have the best of both worlds. That's, that's all very interesting. There's a lot of emphasis there on choice, and I wonder how much of our choice is actually freely given to us. Uh, as you mentioned, there's a number of monopolies that seem to govern information at the moment. And similarly, I know the book opens with uh, attention monopoly as a, as a title. Uh, and I wonder, whereas while, while information may be freely copyable, I know that there is a limited resource there, which is attention. And, and how do we bridge that gap between the, the vast amount of information that can be shared online, but the limited attention that people have? 
Well, I think that's a great question. And I mean, I think there are two parts to that. I think there is, one part is that we can be given choice, more choice. Um, at the moment, if I want to connect with my friends, um, basically I have to use Facebook or WhatsApp or, or basically both of which are owned by Facebook. And uh, certainly on Facebook, I have, I have no choice as to how my news stream works, what ads I'm shown. Um, I, I can't even choose to have a social network without advertisements intruding on my attention. Um, it's sort of kind of going towards those dystopias where you're forced to watch advertisements, you know, whether you want it or not, you know, almost with your eyes held open. And similarly, I think, but it's more subtle, is even Google shapes what we, we know and find online in ways we don't necessarily even know or at least have a say in. Um, you know, um, we, we, we really don't understand that. I mean, a credible piece of recent research showed that Google actually have the power to change elections. The impact that what they could put when you search for a politician on their home page, um, the impact of that on an undecided voter was sufficient to change many elections around the world if it were used in that way. Similarly, we can imagine that Facebook would have that kind of power. And that is really a, a serious concern. And I think what the, what the book is saying is that if we were to choose openness, if we were to open up the software, the protocols, not your personal data, that would remain yours, but the actual the infrastructure, the algorithms and the technology that run those platforms so that anyone could be creating them. So those systems became competitive or became like the internet where anyone could participate and there was real choice, that would be a first step. I think there is a second point about attention, which it is partly up to us how we direct it. And it's certainly the case that we suffer from information overload. Um, the real coin of the book is that we don't even have, we are getting exploited, if you like, and manipulated, and we don't have a choice, really. We are forced to use these systems. There is no alternative that's competitive with them. And openness would bring that back. So the alternative then to choose open, uh, what kind of world would that look like? What would the changes be? What would, what would I see walking down the street? Yeah, no, that's a great. What kind of changes would we see? I think there are, one of the points of uh, the book is that from a point of view of, let's say, innovators, or even the system as today, if we're seeking a significant change, and what the book, just to summarize, is saying is that how would we move from our current world of closed, which is basically based on intellectual property monopoly rights, patents and copyrights, which are essentially small state-granted monopolies that we give out in order to have a way that innovative creators are paid back um, in a kind of state of nature without any intellectual property monopolies. You know, anyone could just copy any other idea in the way that we can just repeat a joke we hear on, the, you know, you tell me a joke, I can go and repeat it. But if we could just do that with uh, anything, software, medicines, etc., the price would immediately become very low and therefore the creator might not get paid. So a crucial question in the book is about is how, how can we move to openness where we don't have those monopoly rights so that anyone can share and copy and we pay creators at the same time. And the way to do that, as the book sets out in some detail, is, is about instigating this new kind of right called a remuneration right that separates paying the creator from the charge for access. Now, I don't want to go on about that, but what I want to talk about here is your question of what would change. For the point of view of a creator or an innovator, someone who's doing a startup, who's uh, writing a book, creating a movie, actually things would look quite similar in terms of the income they, came, they got in, the, the form of got it, they'd have a remuneration right to their copyright today. So in a certain sense, um, that wouldn't change. I think that what you could say would change is that it would be fairer. At the moment, as we see, be it in, in the online world, we have this incredible kind of winner takes all model where there's a few incredible superstars, uh, be it the Googles and Facebooks, and similarly, even in other areas of music, and then everyone else gets very little. In this model, the, 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 result, the payments to those kind of things would probably get more fairly distributed. And I think that would be good for entrepreneurship, be good for startups. It would give more of a chance for a more kind of open playing field. But in general, it would look similar at least, at least what you had. From the consumer, and the citizen point of view, I think it would be really different and better in the sense that what it would look like is basically Spotify for everyone, 
or Netflix for everyone in the sense that there would be unlimited access to music and movies and culture. Um, I think also not just the access, but the, the ability for people to build on it, to create with it. Um, I mean, I always love that wonderful story about the, first, the, the, the fourth Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, where some people thought it was pretty terrible, particularly the character of Jar Jar Binks. And you had someone there who decided to go and edit the movie and remove all those sections. Now in today's world, that's kind of illegal. That person will get sued by the owners of the copyright of the original Star Wars, and, and you know, unless they think it's kind of good for them, but it will be taken offline. But in this new world, people will be able to build on the work of others. They'll be able to remix, uh, create, really with real freedom. So not only will there be greater access, and that ranges from, most from software to medicines, um, but also there'll be this ability to remix. Um, and I think that, almost I can't imagine quite what that would be like. I mean, we had one taste of, I think, with the internet. When the internet first happened, you know, really became mass in the 1990s and 2000s, there was this incredible flourishing of human entrepreneurship and creativity. But I think the irony even actually is, is that people like Facebook and Google are really the children of the open internet. If it had, the internet had been controlled by, you know, the telephone monopolists, there's no way they'd have got going. They, they would just not have been able to do what they did. I mean, I think that is actually an illustration of the 1990s, the incredible um, well, I mean, abundance that we saw uh, that was so exciting. I think that's what we could be seeing kind of all the time. Um, and that's what I think is really possible there and what would be different. So I think it would really change, transform maybe the innovation process. It would transform our access to culture, but also change the way our economy and basically society is working and bring back, I think, democracy to the online world. It sounds like a world I'd love to, <laughs> love to be living in <laughs> sometime soon. So I know the book covers a couple of examples in history, so such as the environmental movement and how that sort of emerged, become quite commonplace. Do you see that emerging around open information as well, that, that kind of cultural thinking? Yes, that's exactly what uh, I, I think that's absolutely correct. So first of all, I think I want to start by saying, so the analogy here of the environmental movement is that the issue, well, sorry, maybe I'll start again there. I think what I want to start also is that I've talked about, in a way, quite a lot about the positive side of things. And I think you also have to emphasize that the direction that we're heading in today by default in our closed world is truly scary and truly worrying. Um, the levels of concentration of power and wealth in this world are, are endangering, I think, the, the, kind of structure, the, the kind of structure of our economy and of our society. Um, and having really major impacts outside of what you might think of as just the technology area or something like that. For example, I think it's now clear that the, um, this combination of costless copying, which is amazing, in combination with the exclusive uh, rights, exclusive monopoly rights, is leading to significantly growing inequality. I would actually suggest that it is one of the major drivers of the growing inequality we've seen in the last 30 or 40 years. And that is now behind a lot of the political instability we're seeing, the rise of populism. Um, even I would say, whatever you think of it, the election of Donald Trump, I think you could trace to the running of the digital economy on old rules, on our old rules, our monopoly rights, um, is actually behind that because it is a direct connection between that um, though that um, exclusive ownership and the rising inequality we've seen, the, the lack of support, you know, the blue collar, the white collar workers who are now dispossessed and the kind of anger and upset that really motivated some people to, you know, some of the, the voting in 2016 around Brexit and things. Whatever you think about, whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing, what I think you can see is that those people are upset the dispossessed, there is a growing set of dispossessed people who are understandably upset, um, understandably feeling excluded in this new world. And I think you can trace a lot of that to this concentration of wealth being driven by these old rules in this new digital world. So I wanna kind of start with that point of just saying, it's actually really worrying where we're going if we don't change. We are heading for the cliff, I would say, in some sense. Uh, we're heading for a world of the dispossessed, a world of manipulation and exclusion. 
um, at a really extraordinary unprecedented level. And the irony is at the same time, we have this incredible opportunity that the digital world offers us, both in terms of innovation and creativity, but also in sharing that abundance with all. And I think that um, in the metaphor then of the environmental movement, you could, or the connection, the analogy of the environmental movement is to make this happen, to have an open world happen, is a major shift in our thinking. It's a paradigm shift. And that requires us to create a movement. Um, just as the environmental movement was created, as from a disparate group of people who initially just had concerns they wanted parks, they wanted good air in the city, and now people say, well, I want, I want a chance where I get to choose what goes on, you know, what, I don't want Facebook getting to decide about everything I, I get to do online, or well, they're controlling the entire future of the innovation ecosystem around that plat incredible platform, um, or people who are concerned about genetically modified, control of genetically modified seeds, to people who, like, you know, who worry, will I be able to afford uh, medicines when I get older or when I get ill? Across these different spectrums, like the environmental movement, I think we need to knit those diverse concerns together into a broad-based movement for change in the information economy, in the digital economy. And like the environmental movement, it takes awareness. For a long time, people thought that the ocean was infinite. Whatever we put in the ocean, it wouldn't make a difference. I think similarly, there's a tendency to think about, oh, well, um, you know, basically, Basically, the information age is it's kind of like we had the Industrial Revolution, we had the Agricultural Revolution, it's just another big change. It's just, um, it's just faster or quicker or more innovative. They haven't seen that there is this profound difference about the information environment, that information is different, that it's costly copyable. And that changes everything. And that means that there is this possibility of a new and better world in this way if we are willing to change the rules. And I think that awareness needs to spread and we need to build a broad-based coalition and movement for change. So the movement, replacing the rule book, uh, how do we, in the environmental movement, it might be somewhat easier to identify the bad guys, if we were to call them that, or the old guard, yeah. um, and, and rise up against it and protest. Uh, it, it seems that uh, with the information economy and many monopolies uh, governing the way the information flows, that may not be so easy at the grassroots level. Uh, where would people start? How would they you know, empower themselves? How would they inform themselves? Apart from reading a book, and getting started. I think one thing I, I, I start by saying that I think is um, a real advantage and there's a difference from the environmental movement, if you like, there's some similarities, but the difference is that in a sense, what we have here, at least at an overall level, is a real win-win. Um, environmentalism, obviously, there is a sense also of an ultimate, you know, the planet is saved, but there is a sense of a trade-off, you know, we maybe have to consume less now to have a better future, whatever. In this area, we can really have guns and butter. We can have more innovation and more access to knowledge, to movies, to music, to software, and so on. And that, I think, actually, it kind of explains maybe why there are less obvious enemies. <laughs> and I, but there are, I mean, there are obviously that set. So, so I think that's one point, which is that this is a real opportunity for governments, for, for, for groups, to really have a win-win. At the same time, there are those most definitely who benefit, if you like, from the current system, and who would lose out to an extent. They would, their monopoly would be, there would be more competition. Well, that would be great for everyone, but not so good for the monopolists, maybe. So obviously people like, I think, like Facebook and Google um, aren't really uh, in favor of these kind of, this kind of far-reaching change. I think there are other groups you might look at, but I think in general, the point at the moment, I would say, is less even that we have to fight enemies. It's just that people, I think, when you talk to most, for example, policymakers or even most ordinary people, they understand intuitively that the digital world is different in some way. Um, and there might be good things or bad things about it, but I don't think they're present to how is it different? You know, maybe there's a sense of just, oh, it's faster. But people who saw a car replace a horse probably thought it was a pretty dramatic change. There's something really distinctly different about the move to an information economy. And that is this fact that information can be costless and reproduced. You cannot snap your fingers and have a million Ferraris 
or a million houses like that. You can snap your fingers and have a million copies of War and Peace, a million copies of Windows, a million copies of um, Angry Birds. And that changes everything. I keep saying that, but it's really fundamental. And I think when people, that is the starting point where people need to think about that and say, okay, but wait a moment. Why then are we imposing the rules that look like, you know, property really works. Property, I own my bicycle, it's mine. I own my, or you know, I own my house, or I have my house, or I own my car. That really works. But that model, when we try to change it into intellectual property, really we made intellectual monopolies. And what we need to do is really innovate here and create a new kind of ownership, a new kind of ownership, or a new kind of right that doesn't do that, that, that really works with the possibility of costless copying rather than destroying it, rather than taking it away. Fantastic. So the book is now. What would you uh, say to those who want to download, read it, and then get started with their call to arms on the open revolution? Well, in keeping with the nature of the book, the book is both available for purchase um, and also openly, uh, so you can download it, get access to it for free, and contribute that, whatever you feel like. The biggest thing you can really contribute is to share these ideas. This is a movement, this is a vision that's for everyone. It's certainly not mine. In keeping with the thing we say on the book, all of these ideas I've come almost have come from somewhere else. I've, um, uh, they, I'm standing on the shoulders of many, many others. And more also, this is a call to arms um, for the 21st century. This is, this is the greatest opportunity, policy opportunity, policy choice that we have as a society. Um, I think the only thing it could be second to is obviously dealing with climate change. This is really will determine the shape uh, and the nature of the 21st century. Do we have incredible sparring inequality, um, uh, concentration of power and wealth that endanger our democracy, that you know, threaten us with you know, uprising? You know, people ultimately, that's what they do, they revolt. I don't wanna see that world. I wanna see a world where it's peaceful, it's growing, it's prosperous, and it's fair. And that is the opportunity that we have with the Open Revolution to make a 21st century economy, a 21st century digital economy that really works for everyone. And it takes, it will take, it will take uh, a movement. So it takes you. So please come and read the book, share the ideas, share the book with your friends, your colleagues, uh, and let's, help, let's, let's, let's make a world that works for everyone. Fantastic. Well, we can leave it there and um, let people jump off and actually download the book, uh, grab it from a friend, share it to a friend, uh, and certainly um, purchase the book because I understand you know any purchase will obviously uh, benefit you, benefit the movement, and and that can't be a bad thing. That would be amazing. Buy the book. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Rufus. Um, I hope it really does go well. I, I did enjoy reading the book. So thank you very much for providing that early copy. Yeah. Thank you.